You guys already know what this video is about because you read the description and it's not clickbait, but I want to start by talking about my EDC. It's not the FN, it's not the 1911, it is not this very nice Walther PDP. Uh, it is probably something that you expected. It is the humble Glock 19 with the TLR7, and I can't show the holster because it's a prototype as usual. But my everyday carry is also a bunch of other random things that you probably expect, like the Para 2 from Spyderco. Uh, just a fantastic knife. I also have uh, just random stuff like Bluetooth earbuds from Samsung, a wallet containing information that I will hide from you by putting it down quickly, and uh, all sorts of random other stuff like uh, my keys, which uh, I'm not going to show you because it contains uh, these, showing this key ring would reveal a lot of information that I don't want you to see. And that's sort of where we're going with the point of this video. Now if you don't know a lot about keys, Showing you this entire key ring will show you nothing. You will get no information from it. But if you do know a lot about keys, showing you what is on my key ring will let you know exactly what kind of car I drive, exactly what kind of locks I have on the doors of my home. And uh, if you get a good enough shot, let's say one of the keys here, we'll probably do this very carefully in B-roll, you would actually be able to figure out exactly what pattern the key is. And you would be able to tell that this right here is a two, four, six, three, three pin lock. This is a five pin lock, and with that number, you can get this exact key made, and it would open up the lock that this key goes to, which is not the house that I live in, but it is actually hundreds of houses around the country. Hundreds of houses uh, will be opened by this particular key. So if you know what data uh, actually means you know whether or not you should show it to other people. And that is where uh, my phone kind of comes in as well. My phone is just jam-packed with data about me. And if I don't know particularly what that data can be used for, it probably doesn't bother me. But as I learn more about the ways that my phone's data can be used against me, uh, it starts to bother me a little more. Obviously, I carry a few other things as well. Usually there's a notebook, a spare weapon light, small pocket flashlight, and then in my jacket, this is winter season, I have the uh, extra ammo, extra frags, medical equipment, 20-inch valve, the usual winter carry stuff. But uh, let's get back to the normal everyday carry, the stuff that I actually have on me pretty much all the time, everywhere I go. Now, all of the items on this table are double-edged swords, like all tools, like all technology. They can be used used for good or for evil. Firearms, obviously, but uh, yeah, even the single-bladed knife is a double-edged sword. It can be used constructively or destructively, and I have cut myself with this very knife when I myself have been dumb, and I will probably do it again in the future. I might even do it again in this very video if I keep messing with it. Uh, but I am the one who controls when these things are used for good or for evil, except for the phone. The phone is a double-edged sword that I don't control when it is actually used against me. And I don't particularly like that. So we're gonna talk about how to de-Google this phone and make it easier for us to control how it is used productively and destructively. Even though I own this device, and theoretically I own all the data on the device, the data on the device is being generated by me, uh, my activities, I don't really own that data because I don't really control it. It is the large technical companies, like Google specifically for this phone, that has the most control over this device. AT&T has some control over this device, uh, and the United States government has a little bit of control over this device. And part of the reason we're making this video right now today is the government would like more control over this device. There's a bill called the Restrict Act, which is theoretically an anti-TikTok bill, because TikTok is super cringe, and obviously the government should do something about that. But the, the Restrict Act is more than just uh, TikTok. In fact, it doesn't even mention TikTok at all. It is just a control uh, mechanism. The Restrict Act gives the government control over more stuff that you do with your phone and over the apps that you have on your phone. And in some ways, it's kind of like... Um, 
It's kind of like Patriot Act 2.0. 20 years ago, when the Patriot Act was passed, the internet had become a very large centralized source of communications traffic, and the government wanted to see it. The Patriot Act lets them see it. But in the last 20 years, the internet has gotten a lot more top-down control built into it from large tech companies, most of which have popped up in the last 20 years. The Restrict Act is like Patriot Act 2.0. It keeps all the surveillance, and it adds all the control that currently now technically exists. Now this is a Google Pixel phone. Ironically, the Google phone is the best phone to de-Google. And those of you who are watching this particular video on your iPhones at this moment, uh, I'm sorry, you guys don't get a pass either. Security researchers have confirmed that iPhones actually talk to Google servers about as often uh, as Google phones do. Android constantly is talking to Google and telling Google stuff that you are doing on your phone. And your iPhone talks to Google a lot. Your iPhone talks to Apple a lot. Your iPhone even talks to Facebook and Meta quite a bit because of all the relationships between these different tech companies and all the different software layers and hardware layers that exist inside of this phone. So uh, what can you do about it? Well, that's where we get to Graphene OS. So technically Android is open source, the bare operating system. And then on top of that, Google has the Play framework and that is not open source. And that is the thing that's constantly talking to the Google servers. That's what makes the Google keyboard and the Google camera and Gmail and uh, YouTube, an app that you may or may not have heard of before. All of that stuff runs in this Google Play layer that is constantly talking back to Google. That is why even if you have an iPhone, you still have an awful lot of Google stuff baked into your phone running on the top, constantly reporting your activities back to Google. And then there's another layer of insecurity in your phone, which is every app that you install has the possibility to do stuff on your phone. And I know that there are abilities that you have to deny it access to certain things, but for apps to work, they need access to other things. And malicious code can get onto your phone from third parties, etc. So Graphene OS is an Android operating system that removes everything on the top. It is that bare open source operating system and it is hardened in certain ways. There's a lot more protections between the different sandboxes that apps run in and it is regularly reviewed by security professionals because it is open and it is clear. Now, some of you want an all or nothing, completely binary, good or evil solution and there is no such thing. Is Graphene OS 100% completely trustworthy? Well, I haven't reviewed all the code and I'm not a security researcher, so I'm not going to say yes. But I am going to say that I trust it infinitely further than I trust, you know, the other non-hardened stuff. So here's what you do. You get on eBay and you buy a Pixel phone, recent-ish. You get it in the mail, you go through the menus down to about the phone and you double click on the build number over and over and over again until you magically become a developer. Congratulations, you are now a developer. Then you can unlock the uh, settings inside the developer menu that are necessary to install Graphene OS. And I'm not gonna walk you through the entire procedure because they make it really easy to install. All you have to do is take the phone, once you've unlocked the developer features that are necessary, plug it into your computer with a USB cable, and their install web page basically does all the rest. It walks you through the few things that you have to do and then it installs this new operating system that completely removes all of the old Google spyware. Are we allowed to call it spyware on the, uh, on the, on the YouTube channel that Google also runs? Uh, we'll see. So once you have Graphene OS running on your phone, you have bare bones Android with some extra security tools. And the question that you are now probably asking yourself is, is this operating system any good? Is the phone actually useless because now it doesn't have any of the nice features that Google has been working so hard to develop to make people want to buy their phones? And the answer is yes. There's actually two modes that you can run Graphene OS in. The first is you keep it very bare bones and you install open source apps uh, from various open source security minded app stores. And there is no Google framework, Google Play Store, Google any of the, the GPS stuff running on the phone at all. That is your most secure setting. And then ideally most secure would be you never turn it back on, you put it in a box and it never connects to cell phone towers. But if you want the phone to actually function like a phone and be able to message, you're going to connect 
connect it to cell phone towers. And every time that you connect it to something, you're gonna lose a little bit of security. Security and convenience are usually diametrically opposed. I've had people assume that graphene OS makes your phone invisible to everybody on the planet. This can't be true because if you have an Android phone that talks to an AT&T tower, AT&T is gonna see the phone. That's literally how the towers have to work. And they can also kind of figure out where you are. If you're talking to a cell phone tower that's on the west side of Centerville, Tennessee, they can figure out that you're on the west side of Centerville, Tennessee. It's, there, there's no good workarounds for this, so just be aware. But once you get rid of all the spyware on top, the only people who can really see what's going on with this phone are you and whatever traffic you pretty much manually send through to AT&T. But then if you really need your Google apps, if you really need your Angry Birds or whatever cool hip game the kids are playing these days, if you really need your tickety talkities, you can install a hardened version of that Google Play Store that is locked down and in a sandbox. And then you can install the Google Play apps and lock those down in their own individual sandboxes. And that gives you an extra level of security over if you were using a regular off-the-shelf Samsung or whatever. So I recommend that you do a little bit of research on this and figure out what your actual threat models are because it kind of depends. Uh, I've had people say, I'm only gonna do security stuff. I'm only gonna be security conscious if it makes me invisible to the entire United States government, which is a big ask. There are many threat models that exist outside of the NSA, believe it or not. And there's a whole bunch of different weaknesses that exist in a phone outside of tattling directly to the feds. So there's a lot of reasons as cybercrime is going up and we are getting into interesting relationships with other nation state actors. There are a whole bunch of reasons why you would want to limit the security weaknesses on your phone, even if magical uh, NSA quantum computers can still kind of figure you out. Uh, and I've talked about this uh, relating to other things as well, other different apps and programs like using a VPN. Using a VPN does not make you completely invisible or invincible, but it does add an extra layer of security. If you get a graphene phone set up, you don't do anything stupid with it, and you install a VPN, well now AT&T can see that you're connected, they're seeing way less data from you, and that data is now encrypted in the VPN. Now, of course, you have traded AT&T's eyes looking at your traffic to the VPN provider checking on your traffic. So there has to be a new level of trust and nothing is gonna be perfect. Also, you have to kind of keep on top of these things. There's a bunch of VPN providers that I trust way further than Google or AT&T, but I don't trust them completely and I've watched them occasionally get purchased by companies that I trust far less. Now at this point, you are realizing how daunting operational security uh, could actually be. And you're wondering if I actually practice what I preach and I maintain a very high level of OPSEC. And the answer is no, I'm literally telling Google and as much of the public as possible what my everyday carry is, my actual carry gun and, and so forth. I almost showed you my keys a couple of moments ago. So uh, I'm not the best test case. Actually, my wife is a great test case, however. Even though I am using a graphene phone some of the time and an off-the-shelf, mostly stock uh, Samsung phone, which I'm testing for alternative purposes that you will hear about later. Um, Heidi has been running a graphene phone as a busy mom who is technically savvy enough to need a smartwatch and other apps to actually run, but not technically savvy enough that she's going to rewrite the Linux kernel to fix bugs herself. Um, she's been using it for a year with no complaints. So in some ways that is the best uh, possible recommendation for graphene. It is the best test of it as an actual daily driver phone that gives you more control, more security, without adding a whole bunch of additional inconveniences. Uh, I'm a little bit too weird to be that actual, like regular human test case. But uh, I do realize that thinking through some of these issues and taking responsibility for them is daunting. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time going over all of the different threat models and thinking about all the different ways that publishing a podcast or listening to podcasts or downloading podcast apps is exposing my personal data to bad actors and endangering the people that I work with and the people that I love at home to those bad actors. But 
I do think that it is our responsibility. In the same way that when you begin to carry a firearm, you take responsibility for yourself, protecting yourself, protecting those around you, but you also take responsibility for every bullet that you fire. And that is something that will cost you time and it will cost you money. And you will need to continually put time into it to keep your skills at a high level. I think that we need to be thinking that way about some of our digital communications as well. As there are more and more conversations about things like the Restrict Act, which would allow the government more control over our devices than we ourselves currently have now, uh, as there are various bills that deny us the right uh, to have encrypted apps and then need to create control mechanisms to stop us from having the encrypted apps, we need to be on top of this. And there's kind of no alternative. If you lived 500 years ago, you would have needed to know something about swordplay. If you lived 200 years ago, you would have needed to know something about black powder just to survive and be responsible, to be able to carry the responsibilities that you have as a person. And you live in the 21st century. So I think that you have to learn some of this stuff. And at the very least, start thinking about it. The good news is uh, a cheap, Android Pixel on eBay is very, very uh, simple to pick up and it's very, very simple to get graphing on and it's very, very simple to tinker with. If it ends up not being your daily driver, it still is something that you can install ATAC on, use it as a burner. Are we allowed to say burner on, uh, on, on uh, videos that talk about government control? I'm not, uh, we'll see. Uh, it is something that you need to be considering at the very least. Experimenting with uh, probably, and I would say implementing very soon. So my recommendation to you is to begin doing a little bit more reading on the subject. And we want to talk about this more at T-Rex Arms. So in the comments below, I would like for you to recommend to me any security services and experts that can help us get more up to speed on this issue. And I would like you to share this video with some of your friends because I'm getting the sneaking suspicion that YouTube probably won't do that for us.